that is away of the challenges and the struggles that we find ourselves in. And then one day, as much as we're going to have a church triumphant, the church that has overcome on the other side, hopefully we'll have the family that has overcome, that has reached to the other side. Uh, Christianity is a battle and a march. In fact, the devil will contest every inch of ground that you gain. Every time you make two steps forward, the devil wants to take you three steps back. And every gain you make is contested by the enemy. And it's no different in our families. Every time you are excited, you are happy with the family and things are going well, you are celebrating something, somehow the devil has a way that at the end of that he pushes you backward so that whatever gains you have made, whatever anniversary you were celebrating, whatever holiday and a good time you were having, he steals that joy from you. The battlefield. Now, um, I spent many years uh, as a public evangelist running campaigns, and I was counting the other day, I have spoken on campaign and crusades in more than 10 countries. And one of the things that we do when we are preparing for the crusade, we say, we are going to the battlefield. So we've got all night prayers. We've got people praying throughout the, camp, the, the crusade. But in reality, what has happened is that the battlefield is no longer at the crusade. The battlefield is no longer at the evangelistic campaign. The battlefield has come to the home. If there is a place which needs all-night prayers, if there is a place where we need to pray continually, therefore, it's in the family because our homes have become the battlefield. And the reason for that is that the home is the fountain of life. The home is where we go to be refreshed. When the life, uh, challenges of life has beaten us through the day, like a cell phone which is used throughout the day, the home is a place we go to plug in and get recharged, rejuvena rejuvenated, and re-energized to meet the challenges of life. A place called home, it's a place of renewal and revival, a place where we truly belong. Now, it's no surprise that the enemy will attack the family because if he attacks the family, the family being the fountain of life, if he poisons the fountain, people will get sick downstream. If the fountain is diseased, all the streams that flows from the fountain will bring sickness. And that's why he's poisoning the fountain, which is the family, so that People who come to church are deformed and broken. People who go to government are deformed and broken because the very source, the very foundation of life is being poisoned and is being destroyed. And that's what the enemy is doing with uh, life today. In fact, if there is no foundation and it's not strong enough, you've got a structural damage where the cracks and the building will be condemned. And if the center, because the family is supposed to be the hub that holds everything together, but if the center does not hold, the rest of the structure cannot hold. Now, life and death are decided at home. You know, whatever successes, and it's no surprise when the Bible says, you know, the elder must be one who manages his family well. It's because the idea of the family, it's where life is. And if you succeed in the family, you can succeed at church, you can succeed in government, you can succeed in any other places because that's where the family is. So unfortunately, many people are coming out as casualties of home itself. And they are going to the workplace, they are going to all other places, being people who have been damaged at home. Now, when we look at uh, battles in the family, um, you know, somebody said the church is the only army uh, that kills its wounded. Um, but when you look at the family, we will realize that the family is the only army that attacks itself. You see, when it comes to the issue of the family, it's not an enemy who is across the street who is bringing the battle. The 
enemy is within. The battles that we are finding, we draw lines right inside the main bedroom and divide ourselves and one person is on the other side and the one who's on the other side, we have got a war going on, fighting ourselves. So there is not even a need for an outsider to attack. The problem is inside. And even in those circumstances where there is infidelity, um, it's pointless to look at an outsider and say, leave my husband or leave my wife and whatever. No, the problem is not there. The problem is here. The problem, the challenge is within, and that's where our challenges are. Now, in fact, um, we who are supposed to be allies, who are supposed to be carrying this institution together, are attacking each other. Now, if you look into the success of family and marriage in particular, I always um, picture it in this way, that you've got a husband on this side and the wife on that side carrying this, and if they take it back there, that's where joy and happiness is. And they must carry together. But what do we do? We shoot each other's legs. We chop each other's legs. And how will the other one carry this thing that we need to get there when they are limping? Sometimes we shoot both, both legs and make the person permanently crippled. And therefore, this, which is what we are supposed to carry to there, to find our happiness and our joy because this brings our joy and happiness together, intertwined. We end up not going there because we who were supposed to be allies are now enemies attacking each other and destroying each other. Um, marital battles are probably the worst more than any other uh, relationship because they result in murder. And, you know, <laughs> If you go to Pretoria Central Prison, you'll find there are many men who are there for killing their wives and many wives who are there for killing their husbands. And those are the ones that were killed through hitmen, poison, uh, and strangling or beating. We're not counting those ones who have been killed through high blood pressure, depression, and witchcraft. We, we, we're not even counting all of those. You know? um, you know, uh, we're just counting the others. Uh, you know, and all of this because of marriage. And this is why I say to young people, marriage is a risky business. The idea of saying I do, you might just be saying I do to somebody who's going to kill you. It's a very risky business. And that's why you cannot enter it alone without God. And all of these other challenges that comes as a result. Um, now, <laughs> the marital battles are made worse because even those of us who are Christians are not Christian at home. You see, we are Christian at church. Oh, at church is wonderful. If somebody step on your toes, we follow Matthew 18. Uh, my brother, you step on your toe, my toe, and it's painful. And I think it's not nice for you to step on my toe. And, you know, because the pain is unbearable. And the other one understood and apologized to each other. But when we get home, there is nothing. We forget that we are brothers and sisters. No, everything is personal. And this is why divorce rate among Christians is the same as among unbelievers. Because where it matters most at home, we are not Christians. It's like, why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to me? I mean, you find a, a text message, maybe from somebody she was flirting with. It's personal. What is this? Why are you doing this to me? Why are you cheating on me? Instead of saying, ah, uh, my sister. You know, these kind of messages are not good, you know. <laughs> Jesus does not like it <laughs> when we have messages like this on our phones, you know. I think we must pray about this situation. You know, we forget we're Christians and forget that prayer is the answer. You know, she doesn't like your family members, right? Or he doesn't like your family members. When they arrive, the first thing is, when are they leaving? It's like, oh, you don't like my, my family, so even your family must not come. It's like, you've got the demons of hatred. Let me have them also. Huh? I mean, instead of saying, ah, my brother, what you're doing is not nice, not liking my people. Let's pray about your weakness. 
so that Jesus can help you. Right? We forget that what we have, it's a brother and a sister. Someone whom God is still working on. I was talking to the pastor during the week. I said, somebody says, the greatest surprise in marriage should not have been a surprise at all. Because the biggest surprise in marriage is that you are married to a sinner. You just didn't know which brand of a sinner it is. You know? You just didn't know which brand. And as soon as you discover that this one is a lying brand or a cheating brand, you say, I want to get out of marriage. But it's just, you just discovered your brand. You see, in marriage, we attack each other for sinning differently. It's like, why are you doing that sin? Why are you not sinning like me? Right? Um, if we can understand that and we can truly become Christian and address our children, our challenges as, as Christian, um, and in many cases, um, the, the, the devil himself in these wars that we're doing, he doesn't even need to, to get involved. Sometimes we take his side in the process of that because he becomes almost like not involved because we are already declared enemies of each other. Now, um, let's look into conflicts. Let's, get, let's zoom in into the issue of conflict. Now, conflict is common in all relationships. Um, if you start by two people from different backgrounds, different upbringing, different personalities, different ways of doing things, different perspectives of life, and these two strangers coming together to stay together in one house, on one room, in the same bed, they will have differences. And, and it is those uh, differences that brings about conflict. And added to that is that you know, we will always have different ways of looking into, into life and, you know, and add to that their expectations. Expectations that some of we brought into marriage we, without an agreement to anybody. All of us have got dreams of marriage and expectations of what we dream about. And when those expectations that were never agreed upon by anybody and we realize they're not realized, we actually become angry and we find that we're betrayed because what we thought of marriage is not what it is. And all of those things brings about conflict. It's not avoidable. Regardless of how compatible couples are, now for our both premarital and marital uh, couples, we have got an online uh, software that is recommended by the General Conference. Uh, prepare and enrich, which gives us compatibilities of couples and see those ones it's just even before we start working on their preparing them for marriage, we at least have an understanding of areas of challenge in the re But even those who have got the highest level of compatibility, they will st always have different perspectives on, on issues of life and those things bring about conflict. Now, I was in I was in um, in Harare. I was going to speak for a weekend program like this, and I got picked up by a couple at the airport. So I was going to stay at the Crown Plaza. So, so this is what what actually happened. Um, there was um, there was two packing. Now, actually, I think there was actually three packing here that were open. And the wife was driving. So she comes from here. She leaves these ones that are open. And she decides she's going to park there. The husband, who is on this side, passing us, he says, why are you not parking here on these ones that are open? She says, no, I prefer parking there. He says, no, it's easy to park here. There are no cars. He says, no, I prefer that when I reverse park, I want to see on my mirrors the two cars and park in the middle. And this thing is going on and on. The one says, but you can scratch one of those cars. Why not just come here? And as I was listening to the two of them, I realized where conflict comes from. Conflict doesn't come from right or wrong. It's your own perspective of life. He would have, probably like some of us, you would have parked on the two open spaces. But she says, no, I prefer that one. That's my, that, that, that's my preference. And she has got reasons for doing so. And that's what happens in, in life. You will realize that 
Our biggest conflict in relationship is not about right or wrong. It's about different perspectives of how to do things. It's not that we don't agree that the cat must die. It's just that we kill the cat differently. From where you come from, you beat the cat until it dies. From where I come from, we poison the cat. And the one who poisoned the cat says, why are you being so cruel by beating the cat? I mean, it's easy to just poison it. And the one says, who are, who are poisoning the cat says, poisoning, you know, it's dangerous. What if the children can pick up the poison and, and eat it? You know? That's usually our problems. Different ways of doing, and sometimes different ways of doing things feels like it's wrong. Right? And that's why maturity in relationship and marriage is to understand that it's give and take. So, even though I always say to people who get married that people who get married should be people who are tired of always being right. <laughs> you see, when you are always by yourself, you are right all the time. I mean, somebody says it's okay to talk to yourself as long as you don't argue. You don't argue with yourself. You know, you're always right. But people who get married must be people who are tired of always being right. Who wants to experience another right that is different from theirs? which feels like wrong, right? And that's what happens. So even though where we come from, we beat the cat to death, because I love you, we're going to poison it. And next week, we beat it together. And maybe in the process of time, we find our own new way. We drown the cat. We get a bucket and, and drown the cat. So we... We, we develop other ways of doing things and not insist that my way is the only way and no way and so on and so on, All right? So, conflicts um, over money, over careers, over raising children, over sex and all of those things are part of the idea of, of being married. It's a part of experience of being married. In fact, when you tell me that you are married, I tell you that you've got conflict. Um, I won't tell you when you've got a, a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend because people who have got boyfriend and girlfriends, they always put their best foot forward. They always try to act nice. But married people are honest. I always say marriage saves you from pretense so that you can become yourself. Nobody pretends in marriage. It's only the boyfriend and girlfriends you know, who pretend. He says, do you like cooking? Oh, yes. I love cooking. <laughs> You like baking? Oh, yes, I can bake the whole day. <laughs> like, you know, um, even if the guy is stepping on her, uh, on him with a, the lady is stepping on, 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 on him with a high heel shoe, I say, am I stepping on you, darling? Oh, no, 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 it's nothing. J <laughs> just, just massaging my toes. Now, you know, but people who are married are honest. They are honest, they, they tell you they really what they think about the situation and they are honest about that. And that's why we end up with conflicts. It's part of the experience of being married. Um, some couples think that if only we can just solve this one problem, our marriage will be, happiness, will be happy. No, marriage can be happy even though some conflicts are not resolved. Because what makes marriage to work is the fact that you love each other. You see, we don't get married for conflict or resolving conflict. You don't, you don't look at Spencer and say, hey, hey baby, can we resolve conflict together for the next 50 years or so? <laughs> no. The whole idea is that I love is idea is love. It's, it's the idea is for loving each other. But um, you see, many people think oh, it's just only this one problem. My problem is the in-laws. You know, if only that old lady can die. Now, it, 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 it's not... It's, 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 it's not that. The idea of, of marriage is it's much more bigger than that. And let's talk about the relationship between love and conflict. Now, um, as we look into the idea of conflict, uh, uh, many people will say, uh, will understand that love draws people closer to each other. And also you expose the most sensitive part of yourself, which is your heart. And that's why most conflicts will be with the person you love because it draws you closer to each other. I mean, my pastor is sitting at the back there. I can't step on his toes when he's there. But because she's close to me, I'll step on her toes. So love brings us closer 
And it is when we are closer to each other that conflict. Um, and obviously the person who you marry will probably hurt you more than any other things because you're exposing your heart, which is the most sensitive part of yourself. I mean, the same statement said by the person you love has, it's not the same as a stranger. Now, if you get out of here and you find a, a stranger, a guy who is drunk, and he looks at you and he says, you, you are so ugly. Who cares? But when your husband says, you are so ugly, when I married you, I was doing you a favor. It cuts deep. Right? Uh, because of who the person is and the expectation that you have of that particular person. Now, um, many people think like, you know, uh, um, if you look at the couples who are in marital bliss, those who are just uh, close to heaven, and, and those who wish they never married each other, you know, <laughs> if they met at a youth camp, it's like, why did I attend that youth camp? <laughs> Why didn't I go to the one of uh, Pastor, whatever his name is, Nkos? Now, you know, and, and you, you know, you ended up there. And, you know, so the question, is, the point is that it's the difference between mental bliss and those on the other one. It's not the absence of conflict. It is, has to do with the presence of love. Now, the problem with conflict, you see, in a relationship, you're supposed to have a flow between a husband and a wife of love, you know, I love you, I love you too, and I love you more, and, and so on and so on. But conflict create a, a block, blockage. And that's why when people are angry with each other, they don't feel like loving. So that thing they, they hold up inside, that's why they, they talk in sign language, and, mm, mm, because they're bottling, uh, they bottling it up. Because conflict blocks the flow of the love between the two people. Now, Obviously, the goal of uh, uh, conflict resolution is not just to resolve the problem, but to resolve it in such a way that you restore the flow. Because there are people who have resolved conflict, but they didn't restore the love. There are people who are who are, who are married and they divorce, but they're friends now. They can go out for lunch and whatever, but they didn't restore the love. They resolve the conflict. But the idea is to realize that the conflict is a threat to the process of love because it has got this thing that it can block your, the, the flow of love. So the goal of marriage is for the people to be loving each other, for that flowing together. With love, marriage is sensational. Without love, marriage is hell. Right? Without love, you see, without love... You see, love is like the oil or a grease between two metals, between the two people. It smoothens things. But when the love is not there, there is squeaking at every point. In fact, the other person irritates you by everything. Their jokes irritate you. They irritate you for breathing, for just being alive. It's like, you're still alive, what's wrong? You know? You know, so they, they, they irritate you by, by almost everything. So that's what happens when there is no love. It becomes, it becomes hell. So that's why we need to think about the idea that we resolve in such a way that the, 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 the conflict, the love flow continues uh, between the two people. Um, and now, also it's important for us to realize that what makes conflict more upsetting what makes us more angry? It's how we view that in the context of how much we love each other, uh, whether the person, they're doing so because they love me or they don't love me. You see, that interpretation, so somebody comes home late. It's not the anger about being late. It's the idea how I interpret being late with, in relation to whether you love me or you don't care about me. So that's why tonight, right here in Santen, two men are going to arrive at half past 11. Right? Two men are going to arrive at half past 11. One, they will shout at him from half past 11 until 2. <laughs> the other one, they're going to hug him and embrace him. And they're going to sit together and talk. What's the difference? They arrive at the same time. They also didn't notify that they're going to be late. The, the difference is that the, the first guy, 
is not loving. His love bank is low or non-existence. You know, many of you might have read the guy, the book by Gary Chapman, Five Languages of Love. It's a good book, second to mine. But anyway, um, <laughs> I had to put in that one. Now, the, the point is that Gary, Gary Chapman talks about love banks, that every time you do something positive, you are adding to a bank, adding to a bank. So when you do something negative, you are withdrawing to the bank. If you do something wrong, when you have never done something right, it's like you're making a withdrawal without a deposit. The machine is kind. It says insufficient funds. In reality, the machine was supposed to be saying you're broke, get out of here. But insufficient, the crisis in, in, in families is not doing wrong. It's doing wrong when your bank account is empty. So the guy who arrives, the second guy who arrived at half past 11 doing the same thing, his account is overflowing. She knows that this guy loves me. Whatever he was and whatever he's doing, there's a good explanation. There is no need to ask. Because I know it. Because my bank account is overflowing. So I said to people, the only people who must, you know, if you don't do anything wrong, then you must never do. If you don't add in, into a bank account, then you must never do anything wrong. But for those of us who are normal human beings who are going to make mistakes, just wake up. When you wake up, just make a deposit. Just make a deposit so that your account is overflowing. Because you never know when you make a mistake. And then you're making a withdrawal. But a withdrawal in an account that is positive is not a problem. And that's why people do, two men will not understand that both of us were working overtime and the other one was sorted and that one was, was loved and given other benefits. And, you know, for the same crime. And, but, you know, and, 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 and the difference is that what did that guy do before he went to do overtime? What was he doing? And so on and so on. And that's why when men are hanging around, whether in a bar or whatever together, the other one is fooling you. The one whom you are hanging around with the bar, drinking or whatever you're doing, during the whole day he has been texting, baby, I love you, you are the most beautiful thing. You know, nah, nah, nah. The account is overflowing, she's smiling with the phone and she just go back to look back at the message. And you, you never did it. You just say, how ah, we're drinking. <laughs> That's why you sleep on the couch. Now, <laughs> now what, is, what is a conflict? What is a conflict? I would like to suggest that it takes two to conflict. Right? Um, in every conflict... There is not one person who is innocent. If it is a conflict, there will be not one person who is innocent. There will be two, both people are, are guilty. Now, if, if I go to this gentleman here and step on his toe, it's not a conflict, I'm just stepping on his toe. On his toes. And he says, you are stepping on my toes. I said, oh, I'm sorry. There's no conflict. But... If I step on his toes and he pushes me, I say, why are you pushing me? He says, I'm pushing you because you are stepping on my toes. I said, do you have to push me? Why do you have to push me? Why did you put your toes on, on the path? And then it goes backward and forward. That's why for a conflict, you need a respond in kind. There will be no conflict if it is only one person guilty. Every conflict has got two people who participated in making sure there is a conflict. The problem is that with conflict is that we always look at the other side as the one who is more guilty. We look at ourselves as 10%, like mine is negligible, my contribution. The other one thinks this is the one. Yours is 90, mine is 10%. Why should we talk about 10% when you have got a distinction in doing wrong? So... <laughs> I mean, I mean, this is real. It's not even like education uh, score of 30%. So you're doing 90% wrong, and then, you know, so why should we talk about my 10%? But what we fail to realize, on the very same conflict, where I think mine is 10% and hers is 90, she thinks hers is 10 and mine is 90. Because all of us, we belittle our contributions. We are kind to ourselves. And we think the problem is there. So every time we look at the very same conflict, both people are convinced you are the problem. I'm not the problem. Now, if you look at it this way, 
Then, if I think mine is just 10%, just 10, it's little, negligible. If I remove my 10%, I apologize for coming home late. You know, because it's my 10% or for stepping on your toe, I remove my 10%. Actually, by doing that, I'm removing the other person's 90%. And when, and when they feel their load has been removed, then they can remove their 10, which is my 90 so if we can just understand that mathematics, we will realize that stop, don't emphasize how big the other person's problem is. Look at yours, the one you believe is small. Remove that. You'll be removing big for the other person. Now, conflict is not always bad. Conflict is not always bad. Now, <clears throat> um, con conflict can lead to a process of oneness, can, can actually draw us closer to each other. They say when a railway line, um, when a railway line has uh, has <clears throat> broken, it's a terrible thing when a railway line has broken. But what the welders do, they bring two bars, one on the left, one on the right. They bring two bars on the same part where it is broken, and they weld the bars on both sides. This place that was broken becomes the strongest part of the rail because it has got three bars. If ever it's going to break, it, it will be somewhere else, not here. So the idea of a conflict and how you resolve the conflict, you might be strengthening that area of your marriage to become the strongest so that it doesn't bring, break in any other place. So the fact that it, break, it broke is a blessing that we can put the bars and weld it and make sure that this becomes strong. And we, whenever we think of a broken, we we'll look at other places, not here. Um, conflict is also an opportunity to know, to accept, to adjust our differences. Now, Dr. Kiss, who, is a, who used to be a lecturer at Andrews, tells a story of how when he was, um, um, after he finished his undergraduate degree, um, studying for his master's at Andrews, he got married. And his wife was working, and he was a student, full-time student. So he says every time in the morning, the wife will wake up, go and take a shower, come back and make a bed, go to work. Take a shower, make a bed, go to work. And she continued doing this routine. And he was watching this wife's routine. Shower, make a bed, go to work. He says, my wife is working too hard for us. What can I do to help her? So when she went to the shower, he made the bed to help out because he's a student. He says, let me help out by making the bed. She goes to the shower, he makes the bed. And this was going on. The wife noticed this, just going on. Until one day, they had a conflict. And in the midst of the conflict, she blew up and says, yeah, I realize you think I don't know how to make a bed. Even the way you make a bed is not better than mine. <laughs> because all along, she is watching this thing annoyed. Not realizing the reason behind. It's a, newly, it's, a newly, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new marriage. In her mind, you are doing this because you think I don't know how to do it. Only to find that the reasons are that I'm trying to help you. And sometimes... Conflict helps us to understand why are you doing that? Because that might be a positive reason and I might be upset that you continue to do that and you continue to do that, whereas, you know. Um, one other reason is that, with conflicts, is that opposites attract. We tend to be attracted to people who are opposite to us. People who are organized always marry the ones who are a bit disorganized. The ones who are neat, maybe the ones who are not so neat, you know. Uh, it's, it's always the opposite. The one who is like you, you are not attracted to. But the problem is, as soon as we are married, you want your partner to be like you, right? So the ones who leave their socks and underwears on the floor, marry the ones who are neat, you know. Um, and the ones who just leave the plates and not wash them, what are the ones who are you know, who wants them to be clean. Now, you see, and unfortunately, 
People who are married, they think they are married to lecture each other. You know, no, you're not married to lecture each other. If the, the spouse leaves things on the floor, you are married to pick them up, to make it neat. So if the husband he just leaves them there, instead of shouting, hey, Jackson, who do you think is going to pick up this thing? No, it's, it's less energy, it's less stress to just pick them up and put them there. That's why you are married to compliment each other. If the wife does not like doing the dishes, she leaves them for three days, four days for rust experiment, and it's a problem to you, wash the dishes as a man. Stop shouting, why are you leaving these dishes? Why are you leaving? Wash the dishes. Now, a couple came to me, and this guy makes an example. He says, I don't understand. This woman is, is very irresponsible. It's, she, she's got something. I don't know what it is. It's like a, a hot thing that she does the hair with. I don't know what it's a hot. I, she does it in the living room. And then she leaves it there. And he says, we've got a toddler. Every day she leaves it there. Every day I have to pick it. I have to switch it off. I said to him, what's the problem now? Every day she forgets it. And every day you switch it off. So why are we solving a problem that is already a, a solution? <laughs> Just make sure you don't go to work without switching it off. I mean, w w w w I mean, you know she's going to forget it. And your job is to switch it off. I mean, let's, let's deal with other problems without solutions. <laughs> the ones with solutions, let's put them aside and move on to the next. And, and that's the idea. We are here to compliment each other, not to, not to judge each other. Because you realize that those who, who do toothpaste orderly from the back <laughs> marry the ones who just in the, in the in middle. <laughs> there is even those, the gang that in, right next to the mouth, the thing is full, just bend it right there. You know? and, and the idea is that that's not a problem. While they are doing it in the middle, you are going to bring order from the back. And the two are going to compliment each other. So there's no issue of saying that, no, why, why are you doing that? No, we are different. We are here to compliment each other, right? I said to men, if she struggles to cook, you know, cook. And if you can't cook, and she's still, every day she's cooking uh, what we call mboza, in vendor, it's mboza, you know, every time she's cooking mboza. I'm saying, I said to men at, at a workshop recently, I said, stop complaining that you're cooking boards every day. Pray to God to change your taste buds <laughs> so that you can enjoy boards. He's a miracle working God. <laughs> so that you don't keep on having the same conflict every time. God change your taste buds so that you enjoy it. When she cooks, you just, my wife, more. <laughs> and when you go to families where they cook proper, you don't enjoy it. Ah, I'm going to go home. <laughs> my, my wife cooks better at home. I'm going to do my thing at home. Right. Let's stop creating problems when there are solutions, particularly for Christians. Now, dealing with anger. Now, no one can ever make you angry. You know, people always say it's because you make me angry. No, nobody makes you angry. Anger is an emotion. Each one of us decide to be angry. Nobody makes you angry. Now, for example, I can call a gentleman here. You are a dog. And one of them can say, whoo, whoo. And I call another one, you are a dog. He says, yeah. I call another one a dog. Are you calling me a dog? He becomes angry. Now he wants to punch me. You all decide. There is no switch for making people angry. All of us decide to be angry. So make Take responsibility for your own anger. If you don't want people to make you angry, do three, three things. Every time you find yourself in a heated situation, you see people when they say you made me angry, they're responding to a heated situation. If you find yourself in a heated situation, do three things. Pause, think, and act. Pause, think, and act. I was talking to my neighbor. He's a high court judge in, in, in Pretoria. And he was telling me a story about when he was still a lawyer, how he was at a high court representing the, a woman on a divorce case, and the husband came and shot 
the woman in front of him. And he, he was telling me he hid under the table and it was a mess. And we were talking about these things that men usually talk about to say, men, men, men says, if I find my wife sleeping with another man, I'll either shoot her or shoot the man or shoot them both. He says, if you, um, if you find yourself in a situation like that, pause, think, and act. Pause. Don't react. Because if you shoot someone like that, cold blood, you're going to face 25 years to life, and your children are going to go to foster care, and you're probably going to be somebody's girlfriend in, pr in prison. So when you find yourself in that situation, pause, think. Do I want to serve 25 to life for two consenting adults doing whatever they're doing? Do I really want to be somebody's girlfriend in prison for this? Think and act. But many a times, we bypass thinking. We don't pause, we don't think, we just act. And you end up in trouble. And now that's an extreme case we're talking about. But what do we do in normal, um, for those of us good Christians? You say something horrible when you're angry. Right? Um, the issue of physical abuse, it's, it's a horrible thing. It's beyond imagination. But there are things that we say in our words that do not heal after 20 years. The woman said to me, he said something when he was angry. We tried to reconcile, but every time we were happy, those words came up of what he thinks about me and my family. So before you say something that you cannot withdraw, even with an apology, pause, think, and act. There is nobody who's pressurizing respond now. Take a walk. Think and act. Guidelines for resolving conflicts, let's, let's, let's run through them quickly. Number one, resolve the conflict, not each other. Many of us, it's normally said, play the ball, not the man. Many of us would like to play the, ball, the man. You are like this. You are like that. No. No. Listen to, to, to the ball. The words you have used are painful. It's not that you're a bully, that you are horrible. You have taken after one of your female parents who gave birth to you. Now, it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's, it's not that. It's the words that you have used. You know, if you play the ball, you will realize many conflicts will be easy to resolve. Now, um, instead of um, saying, you know, maybe you are angry about something, uh, the person you are talking to someone and they don't respond. You are stubborn. You are this and that. You whatever. Play the ball. The ball is that I feel frustrated when I speak to you and you don't respond. Because have you noticed when I told you that you are stubborn, you are this, you are mean, you are unkind, the person starts defending. We are saying I'm mean. You say I'm stubborn. What about you? Because you are playing the person. Play the ball. The ball is, I feel frustrated when I talk to you and you don't respond to me. That's the ball. If every time we find what the ball, every time it's a conflict, stop and ask yourself, what is the ball? And who is the player? Play the ball. Focus on the, on the ball. The ball is the words. The ball is um, your actions and so on and so on. Those are the actions that I don't like. It's not you that I don't like. You I love, you I respect, but the actions, the words are hating me. Uh, somebody has bewitched my thing. Um, get me to the next slide, somebody there. Uh, 
Okay. Um, the next. Uh, okay, now that's fine. We can we can go to the next one. That I I don't know whether I remember. Um, <coughs> so is the computer like on strike or something? All right. What is the next one? Um, when okay, we're like halfway, like. Okay, so many a times um, when we have uh, number two, um, whenever you are angry and in the midst of conflict, don't say things that show lack of commitment. Yeah, I think I was right. Okay. Right. So there are people who every time there's a conflict, people become angry and say, um, I wish I never married you. Um, I think this marriage was a mistake. Um, I'm leaving. I don't know whether I'm going to come back. You see, that those attitudes are people who fail to realize what a conflict is. They view a conflict as a mountain, as the end of the road. That every time we have a conflict, we are at the end of the marriage. No. That's not what a conflict is. A conflict is like a hump on the road. When you see a hump, you don't turn back and say, this place has got humps, I'm not driving this place, I'm going home. No. When you see a hump, you slow down, get over the hump, and continue. What does the conflict require from us? Slow down, try to understand, and continue. There will still be a marriage tomorrow. And one example is um, if you have been planning, let's say a surprise thing for your wife, surprise birthday, or a surprise getaway. You want to go somewhere together, and you fight tonight. You were planning during the day, you didn't finish, and you fight tonight. Some people tomorrow, they cancel those holiday plans because the idea of us having a fight, a conflict, is the end. No. The maturity of understanding conflict is a person who, when you leave home, you had fought, and you still go to work, and plan a surprise getaway. Because you know that beyond this hump, there will be us. And we are planning. We are going to do this in December. I'm going to planning a romantic time together. We're doing this because we'll still be there. So we need a maturity. That doesn't, like a baby who throw all the toys just because the baby is angry. You don't throw everything else. You don't throw the marriage and everything else because of that. You slow down. Have faith. Have faith. I believe marriage is the greatest act of faith among mortals. I mean, can you imagine? You meet a stranger, different backgrounds, different personality, different upbringing, and you say to this stranger, I will love you, I will cherish you, I will change everything else. I will change my suit, I will change my clothes, I will change my job, I will change my complexion. I will change my hair. I will change. I will change everything except you for the rest of my life. That's an act of faith for human beings who are ever changing their mind. I mean, I wonder whether people say that with a sober mind that I'm going to change everything except you. You are going to be the one constant. I mean, in this society where we are shaving eyebrows and painting them back, I mean, it's, 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 it's. It's, it's, it's serious, the idea that I will change everything else, but not you. It is an act of faith. But as soon as we're married, and then we have got um, little challenges, we say this marriage will not work. We lose faith. But the same faith we had, we must carry that. Even the challenges that we have, um, the faith will carry us forward. 
focus on win, don't focus on winning the argument, but focus on winning the friend. So many of us were just people are so much wanting to win arguments. If you look into some of the conflicts we have at home, they have nothing to do with anything that of life and death. You just trying to show how much you know. Somebody says vets has got an agriculture department. The one says there's no agriculture. The one says it, it has. The other one says there's no. Who cares? You don't own the institution. I mean, where there's agriculture at vets or there's no agriculture, who cares? Why are you making a big deal out of, out of it? I mean, married people are trying to show how much they're smart. Why are you trying to prove you're smart when you're married? It's too late if you're dumb. <laughs> I mean, why do I need to prove to you that I'm smart if you're already married to me? I mean, you're stuck and I'm healthy. He says, until death. <laughs> and, and, and the point is that they're trying to prove how smart they are. How, why? You know, I mean, it doesn't make sense. I was, um, you know, a couple was, uh, was driving. It was uh, just after sunset. It, was, it wasn't very clear. And the, the man says, that's a beautiful blue car that went that side. And the wife says, no, that car is not blue. It's actually green. And the, and the man says, no, I saw the car. It's blue. The wife says, you think I don't have eyes. You think I cannot see. The car is green. He says, you know, why is it everything that I say? You're always challenging it. And they go forward, fighting backward and forward until they get home, not talking to each other. But who cares? It's not even your car. I mean, whether it's blue, whether it's green, who cares? Why do you want to make a big deal about winning arguments? Right? Focus on winning a friend. Don't try to prove you're smart or whatever. Many a times, it's those little arguments that irritate us. You just find yourself angry. You don't know why. Only because those little things, you were trying to prove smart, you know. You know, they, <laughs> you might have had a couple that was an elderly couple. They, 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 they after being married for 50 years, they, uh, the reporter went to them and says, what is the secret for your long marriage? Um, what is the secret? What is the secret of your long marriage? Are we supposed to conclude? Oh, okay. What is the secret of, 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 your, of your long marriage? And the, the woman says four words. You are probably right. That's the old lady. He says, just those four words. He says, yeah, that's how we, most of the conflict, we avoid them by doing that. They went to the old man and says, we're talking to your wife here. She's talking things that doesn't make sense. She says the secret of your success is four words. You are probably right. It doesn't make sense. And the old man thought for a while and said, she's probably right. <laughs> and, and, and they decided they're not going to waste their energy on debating things that nobody's going to die. If you can learn to just say, you're probably right. You know? And when you do that, and you avoid many of the examples and many ch ch challenges. The, the <laughs> um, uh, all right. Um, always be prepared to be the one who blink first. In many of our couples' marriages, it's like uh, we're like little children staring. Who is going to blink first? Right? Be prepared to be the one who blink first. In fact, I always say the one who is more spiritual must be the one who blink first. If somebody has offended you, don't expect the one who has offended you, who is a sinner, to be the one who fix it. Many people are waiting for an apology. No, how will a sinner save you? That's why Christ left heaven and came down to our level. He, we had offended him, but he who was without sin came down to reconcile with us. Even in our relationships, the one who is holier must be the one who goes down to save the sinner. Because we've got a standoff. Apologize, apologize. No! Find one who is spiritual. Every marriage will need a savior from time to time. Be that savior. That saves your marriage. Um, do not return evil with evil. Um, you know, many of our relationships are tit for tat. Do good for the evil. Do good. Not because you are a fool. The Bible, God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. 
when you do good to someone, when you forgive them, it doesn't mean the offender will not go without paying. It just means when I forgive you and I'm not retaliating to you, I'm handing you over to God to deal with you. So I'm just saying with me, I'm not going to fight you, but I'm handing you over to God. Um, so do good. Um, stop the devil's agenda. You know, um, The devil's agenda is not just to tear our marriages apart and whatever. The devil's agenda is to get us all to hell. So what does he do? He will come through one person. Let's take, for example, infidelity. He will come through one person through infidelity. Now, I always say, I was talking about infidelity in Orlando West last week, and I said to them, anyone who commits adultery will be caught. So if you're already doing adultery now, have a plan of what you're going to do when you are caught, because you will be caught. You don't get caught because you are reckless or you didn't leave the messages or chats or the phone logs. No, you get caught because the devil is in charge of the adultery curriculum. After he gets one into sin, his job is to expose that one. Because he wants to get one through adultery, the second one through bitterness and anger. To say, he, he doesn't want to, you see, as long as you didn't know, you were not going to be bitter and angry. So he exposes that person so that you can be bitter and angry and not forgive. So one is gone through adultery. Second one, through bitterness and anger. Then you separate and divorce. The children are angry for their parents separating. And therefore, they leave church and whatever. He got the children through discouragement. So he's got the whole family in hell. So the devil's agenda is hell to burn everybody. So that's why when you see one hole opening, close that hole. Instead of allowing the devil to come in and tear apart everybody. Uh, loving confrontation and uh, relation to the 1910 that we said, um, after you have um, um, uh, looked into your own, after you look over conflict, look back and say, what is my contribution? What did I do? What is my 10%? Which the other one's 90? Look at it, write it down. This is what I've done. This is my mistake. Go to your partner and say, I have done this. I've said this. I shouldn't have said it. I've done this. I shouldn't have done this. And I apologize. When you do that, you are saying to your partner, the game has changed. Instead of pointing at each other's mistake, let's point at ourselves' mistakes and see how we can resolve that quickly. And then, lastly, pray and wait upon the Lord. Right? Um, many of us, we want things to be resolved overnight. But some things will take time. It requires us to pray, to trust in God until God comes through for us. As we conclude, in Jeremiah 18, God comes down to Jeremiah and he says to Jeremiah, Arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will cause you to hear my words. God is saying to Jeremiah, you might not understand me where you are, but go down to the potter's house and when you get to the potter's house, I will cause you to hear my words. Then Jeremiah says, then I went down to the potter's house and there he was making something at the wheel. The potter was busy working something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. Whatever he was working on broke. It broke into pieces. But it was still in the hands of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. And he took the pieces, put them together, and made it again into another piece. Then comes the appeal from God. Oh, house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord. Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so you are in my hands, O house of Israel. God is saying to us, something might have gone wrong, conflict, whatever it is. While you were in the hands of God, you might have been mad. God says, as you saw the potter do, put it together again into another vessel of honor. The first project that you initially worked on, that you planned, 
might have been mad. It might not have been what you purpose it to be. Mistakes happen. Things went wrong. God says, as much as you saw the potter, oh, house of Israel, can I not do with you? Can I not give you a second chance? Can I not rebuild you? Can I not give you another chance to have glory and honor in spite of the mistakes you have made, in spite of the brokenness that you have had? God says, oh, house of Israel, I am the potter and you are the clay and you are still in my hands. Even though you are broken, I can fix you. Even though your honor and, and whatever you had and whatever plan you had has failed, God says, I can make you into something better. I can take the pieces and put them together again. And this is God's plan and this is God's uh, appeal to us tonight to say, you are just the clay. I'm the potter. I can put you together again. And tonight I want to pray. Those of us who say, God, put us together again as individuals, as families, as married couples. There might have been cracks. There might, things might have been marred in the process. But put us together again. You are the potter. And we are in your hands. And in your hands, fix us. If ever that's your wish, I'll ask you to stand as we pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the opportunity and the privilege you've given us tonight to come to sit at thy feet to learn from thee. Lord, we pray that as we are standing, we are the clay. You are the potter. Lord, you know the plans we had in the beginning and you know how they were marred. The plans we had as families, the plans we had as couples, and how sin has marred those original plans that we had. But tonight we realize we are still in your hands and you are the potter. You can take the broken pieces and put us together again. So our standing is to say, Lord, put us together as individuals, put us together as families, put us together as married couples, put us together. We are standing to to say we are just a piece, but connect us with other pieces and make us whole. Make us a vessel of honor, a vessel that will glorify you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.